Hello, and welcome to the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca Larson. I'm the owner of TudorsDynasty.com, and today I'm going to talk about Queen Elizabeth. I know, I know, I still have one part left in my life in Tudor England series, but I really needed to take a break from the topic for a week or so so that I can come back refreshed and ready for the big finale. So this will be what we call in the podcast world a supplemental episode. For those of you who are regulars to the show, welcome back. If you're new to the show, welcome. For those who are new here, I do take a minute at the beginning of every show to thank the people who have been generous enough to donate and become patrons to keep the show going. I have four new patrons since the last episode that I need to thank. Johanna, Dora C, Anastasia L, and Courtney D. Thank you so much, you guys, and welcome to this awesome gang. I'd also like to thank Anna, Bob, Peggy, Diana, Stacy, Christopher, Rachel H, Rachel D, Michelle, Lacey, Diane, Kathy, Christine, Katie, Joy, James, Anne, Azaria, Lisa, Nora, Sarah, Wendy, Mary, Cynthia, Melissa, S, Nicole, Mary, Cheryl, Carrie, Heather from the English Renaissance History Podcast, Tanya, Donna, Catherine, Jen, Lara, Megan, Melissa C, and Pat. Be. Before we start this episode, I do need to take a minute to talk about the show. So if you're new to this podcast and you found me on iTunes, you are missing out on a bunch of episodes that came before I integrated with iTunes. If you're interested in hearing all of them, you can go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudor's Dynasty and click on posts. I also have a link to them on tutorsdynasty.com in the menu. If you found me in iTunes, I'd also love to see some more five-star ratings and comments there. The more reviews, the higher I will be in the recommendation list for other Tudor lovers. Without all of your support, I wouldn't be able to continue with these podcasts, so I cannot thank you all enough. It's not only my podcast that you support, but also my website. All the money received from patrons like you go right back into the show. The cost of running the website and research materials, including subscriptions to those hidden or hard to find documents and books. Believe it or not, I do have a full time day job, and this is something that I do in my ever decreasing downtime. Creating a podcast can easily take 15 hours. This is something that my husband may not be too keen about, but it's my passion and he supports me. If you'd like to become a patron of my podcast, go to Patreon. Again, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudor's Dynasty and click on Become a Patron. For as little as a dollar per month, you can show your support. If you have any feedback for the show, I might regret saying this, please send an email to tutorsweekly at gmail.com. Okay, let's get on with the show. Sit back, relax, and prepare to be transported back in time to the life of Elizabeth Tudor. She was the most eligible woman in all of England. Elizabeth Tudor, daughter of the great Henry VIII and his ill-fated second wife, Anne Boleyn. So I've been researching Thomas Seymour off and on for the last two years, but I've really focused on him in the last year. To many of you, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but those who are new here, please know I am fascinated by Thomas Seymour. I guess maybe you could say there's a part of me in his story. I can relate to him in so many ways. I guess that may be one of the reasons why I feel so strongly about the slander surrounding his name. Thomas Seymour had made some bad decisions. Been there. So have I, Rebecca Larson. I'm not judging. But to look at his story from the aspect of giving him a voice or let Thomas tell his story, it just means so much to me. So because of that, I've collected nearly every book that might have any mention of his name, including nearly every book on Elizabeth. I've read every piece of correspondence I could find. And lastly, what other people had to say about him over time. My favorite part of Thomas Seymour's story is how he finally ended up with Catherine Parr after four years apart. I mean, come on, how can you not see the romance in their story? Two lovers torn apart by the aging and obese King of England, only to reunite almost immediately after the King's death. Then they have a love child, only for Catherine to die and Thomas nearly go mad with grief. I guess I'm just a sucker for happy love stories that end tragically. Well, 
Like, really tragically, Catherine died in 1548. Less than a year later, Thomas is executed, and then their daughter Mary died young, more than likely. They finally got everything they wanted, only to have it all destroyed a year later. So sad. Tragic. But a great story. Okay, now back to the serious stuff. But no, really, I am really obsessed with Thomas Seymour. My constant research on Thomas Seymour has led me on an unexpected journey to discovering the young Elizabeth Tudor. Thomas played an important role in Elizabeth's time during her guardianship with Catherine Parr. From those of you who read my blog often, you know that I tend to write mostly about the reign of Henry VIII. Don't be judgy now. Henry VIII is where I started my curiosity and research. So he really does have a special place in my heart. I will also defend Henry VIII if he's being unjustly slandered. I mean, come on, the guy reigned for 38 years. They weren't all bad. Anyway, I've never professed to be an expert on Elizabeth Tudor, Princess Elizabeth, Lady Elizabeth, and Queen Elizabeth, but here I go giving my opinion on her, and I'll talk about some of her marriage prospects. This should be fun. So here's a brief recap of her birth. Born on the 7th of September, 1533, Elizabeth was not the son that her parents had wanted, or even expected. From the beginning, all the royal physicians and astrologers, save one, had predicted that Anne would indeed have a prince. Nevertheless, Elizabeth had a splendid christening that was fitting a princess. As far as her life prior to her mother's execution, I think I can confidently say that Elizabeth had little memory. Just as you and I don't necessarily remember what happened when we were two and a half years old. My son was three when his father and I finally got married, and while he remembered it for a few years after, now at 14, he doesn't remember it at all. The same can most definitely be said for Elizabeth. She wasn't anywhere near her mother at the time of her swift downfall. She was at Hunston House in Hertfordshire. Today, Hunston is 36 miles by car to London. One can wonder if Elizabeth remembered Jane Seymour at all. She would have been only four years old, so again, it is quite possible that she had no memories of Jane. Maybe she remembered no longer being called Princess. She said something to one of her servants to the effect of, Why Princess yesterday but Lady today? That must have been a traumatic event in her life. If she was to remember anything, you'd think it would be that. But now I'm just speculating. Historian David Starkey states in Elizabeth, The Struggle for the Throne, that, quote, There is no evidence that Elizabeth met her father's fourth wife, Anne of Cleves, during her six months of marriage to the king, end quote. But we do know that they knew each other after. We know for a fact that during Queen Mary's coronation procession that Anne was front and center in the first chariot following the queen. She was, after all, a very prestigious member of Tudor court, and she shared the chariot with the Lady Elizabeth, who was heir to the throne. At the coronation banquet, Anne also sat at the same table as the Queen and Lady Elizabeth. This event would be Anne's final public appearance, so we know that there were at least a couple times, if not more, that the two ladies were in contact. We also know that, after the death of Henry VIII, Anne of Cleves had seen her status diminished, but that did not stop Elizabeth from visiting her former stepmother. Anne had established her household at Hever, which must have been comforting for Elizabeth to be there, near the memories of her mother. It was there that she would catch up with Elizabeth to find out what was going on at court and in the realm. It was Catherine Howard's marriage to her father that most likely had the deepest impact on her future outlook on marriage. I recently read that after the execution of Catherine Howard that Elizabeth told her sister Mary that she would never marry. Now please forgive me because I cannot recall which book it was, but it was most likely The Wives of Henry VIII by Antonia Fraser or The Temptation of Elizabeth Tudor by Elizabeth Norton. I was surprised when I read it because it was also a scene in Showtime's The Tudors. Now, Robert Dudley also had been reported as saying that Elizabeth told him at the age of eight that she would not marry. Both instances may have coincided with the execution of Catherine Howard. When we move forward to the woman I would consider her favorite stepmother, Catherine Parr, we see a woman who had great influence on Elizabeth. Catherine was like the mother that Elizabeth never had, and she encouraged Elizabeth to study what she believed to be her mother's faith, the Protestant faith. 
Nowadays, many historians and authors are quick to say that Anne Boleyn was a reformist and not a Protestant. Anne wished to see changes in the church, but before her death was concerned at how far Cromwell was taking those changes. She wanted more of the money from the monasteries to go to charity and not to the king. When I think of young Elizabeth, I'm often reminded of how she must have felt. No mother, a father who had declared her illegitimate and practically abandoned her for many of her formidable years, and English subjects who had looked at her only as the daughter of the great whore. It all seems so unfair by today's standards. These things made Elizabeth the person she later became, just as our own past have made us into the people we are today. After the death of her father, King Henry VIII, Catherine Parr took Elizabeth into her household, something Elizabeth would have been extremely happy about. It is while in that household that Elizabeth experienced her first crush. Thomas Seymour was a very attractive man with a lot of charisma. Elizabeth's attraction to Thomas Seymour is unmistakable. He was considered an attractive man who was easy to like. Elizabeth, like any young lady, enjoyed the attention she received from him. Now my gut tells me that it was his proposal to her, soon after her father's death, that initially ignited the flame. When Catherine Parr caught Elizabeth and Thomas Seymour in an embrace, she was livid. What exactly is meant by embrace is unclear. Whether it was merely a hug between the two is uncertain, but one could assume it was more than a hug. I know this isn't popular opinion, but I get the impression that Elizabeth kissed Thomas and he didn't pull away, letting her teenage hormones get the best of her. Unfortunately, by succumbing to her feelings, she temporarily severed her strong relationship with the woman who meant so much to her, Catherine Parr. Fortunately, Catherine was smart enough to know that the prudent thing to do was to send Elizabeth away. The only people who knew about the embrace were Parr, Seymour, Elizabeth, and Elizabeth's governess, Cat Ashley, whom Parr had told. In order to protect Elizabeth's reputation, she wrote Cat Ashley's kin, Sir Anthony Denny, and his wife, who was Cat Ashley's sister, Joan, to invite Elizabeth into their home. This was to cover up the fact that Catherine Parr wished to separate her husband from Elizabeth. Even Elizabeth's coffer, Thomas Perry, could not remember if Elizabeth, quote, went of herself or was sent away, end quote. Word began to spread of the affair and speculation arose that Elizabeth was pregnant with Seymour's child. These rumors were compounded by the fact that Elizabeth, who now housed with her new wards, became ill and took to her bed. This was once again, like so many times in her youth, an example how Elizabeth's health was associated with traumatic events in her life. These rumors became so bad that Elizabeth felt the need to write the Lord Protector, Edward Seymour, and tell him that she had heard the rumors and would like to come to court to prove them wrong. So, all that was just a taste of what she had experienced in her youth. In 1558, after the death of her sister, Queen Mary, Elizabeth Tudor became Queen Regnant of England. A childhood filled with uncertainties turned into Elizabeth being on the throne of England. Once there, she would not do anything to jeopardize it and the future of her country. Almost immediately after ascending the throne, Elizabeth's council began to encourage her to marry, to take a husband. The Tudor dynasty was in desperate need of heirs. Elizabeth had deeper reasons for being reluctant to marry, primarily the fear of losing autonomy as queen. She understood that she was regarded as holding supreme dominion over England, while in the 16th century a husband held dominion over his wife, even if that wife was the Queen of England. This was something that her sister, Queen Mary, struggled with as well. Then if you add children into the mix, Elizabeth would have been out of commission for most likely months during each pregnancy, while others ran her kingdom. Quote, I will have but one mistress here and no master, end quote, she told the Earl of Leicester, the man who she loved more than any other and to whom she was close to for over 30 years. Many believe that the only man Elizabeth would have trusted enough to wed was Robert Dudley. Dudley was a lifelong friend and someone who most believe would not have tried to rule over her. Unfortunately, that union would not happen for Elizabeth. Dudley was married to Amy Robsard at the time, and the only way to wed Queen Elizabeth was if Amy was not in the picture. Well, we know what happened there. So Robert Dudley married Amy Robsart in 1550, and merely 10 years later, on the 8th of September, 1560, Amy Robsart 
insisted that all of her servants go away from the household that day. There was a local fair going on, and when Amy was found dead at the bottom of her staircase with a broken neck, Robert Dudley was immediately a suspect. However, he was vindicated because he was at court with Elizabeth at Windsor Castle. An investigation was carried out and found the cause of death to be accidental, but this did not remove suspicion from Robert and Elizabeth. It was too convenient. For Elizabeth to be able to marry Robert, Amy could not be in the picture. Whether this was declared an accident or not, Elizabeth could no longer consider Robert a husband. It would ruin everything that she had worked so hard to build, her position as Queen Regnant. There is no doubt that Elizabeth loved Robert Dudley. Unfortunately, he would not wait forever for the Queen to propose. Robert remained unmarried after Amy's death for 18 years. When he eventually married again in 1578, it was to Elizabeth's cousin, Lettuce Knowles. Elizabeth was crushed and saddened by the fact that her love could marry anyone but her, let alone her beautiful cousin, and without her permission. Robert Dudley wasn't the only man wanting to wed Elizabeth. It started soon after her sister's death. Philippa Spain was married to Elizabeth's sister Mary. As we know, Mary was Queen of England from 1553 to 58. After her death, Philip continued to support England and even attempted a union with his dead wife's sister. Elizabeth delayed making a decision on the proposal and had learned that Philip was also considering marriage with the Valois family in France. Elizabeth, we believe, would not have married a Catholic. The problem with this marriage stemmed with Elizabeth's legitimacy and her faith. In the eyes of the Catholic Church, Elizabeth was illegitimate, since the Pope did not recognize the divorce of Catherine of Aragon and her father, Henry VIII. Thus, the marriage of her mother, Anne Boleyn, to Henry VIII was invalid, and she was illegitimate. Or at least Elizabeth would have been considered to be born out of wedlock in 1533, since Catherine of Aragon didn't die until January 1536, making her parents' marriage legit. When Philip of Spain married the French princess Elizabeth of Valois months later, Elizabeth complained to his ambassador that Philip could not, quote, wait four short months to see if she would change her mind, end quote. Agnes Strickland states that Elizabeth always kept the portrait of Philip by her bedside as a token of regard. But in all reality, she goes on to say that it was probably still there when Elizabeth took possession of her sister's apartments. Next, we have James Hamilton, the Earl of Arran. James was a Scottish nobleman whose father was a short-lived regent of Scotland after the death of King James V. Mary, Queen of Scots, was queen at only six days old, and she obviously couldn't rule on her own, so she required a regent. Historian Agnes Strickland states in her book, The Life of Queen Elizabeth, that Henry had also proposed marriage between his daughter and James Hamilton, then heir to the earldom of Arran. So this was not the first time that Arran's name came up in the marriage game. James's father proposed marriage between Elizabeth and his son in 1558 in an effort to cement the relationship between England and Scotland. And in 1559, both James and his ex-regent father declared themselves Protestants. James seems like he would have been an attractive choice to the Protestant Queen Elizabeth. This would, of course, be a political alliance. In August of 1559, Queen Elizabeth received a letter from Sir Nicholas Throckmorton, and it stated that he wishes that she should honorably and graciously receive the Earl of Arran in her court, giving him as good hope as any other. For if he be the same that they hear report of him, he is as well worthy as any other. And give such orders that his being in England be most secret, so that the French catch no apparent occasion to say that she does not keep her treaty." The French ambassador should have no knowledge where he is, for he will press her to apprehend him. The Earl of Arran made a visit to England and presumably a secret meeting with Elizabeth at Eltham Palace, and there is good reason to believe that William Cecil worked hard to attempting to unite the crowns of England and Scotland with this possible union. The Hamiltons were attempting to depose Queen Mary of Scotland and replace her with the Earl of Arran. He was backed by the famous John Knox, as was a marriage with the Queen of England. Of course, this was the last thing that the French wanted. Aaron was considered young and handsome, but also weak-minded. There were times that he was subject to the direful malady, which clouded mental perceptions of his father and brother. 
When Aaron went back to Scotland, he was joined by two English escorts, Thomas Randolph and Sir Ralph Sadler, both considered the Earl of Aaron a friend. They had reported that he had shown signs of mental instability. Now, I've looked and looked through letters and papers to find exactly what they said to indicate mental instability, and I was unable to find anything. Without knowing exactly when they said it, it proves difficult to find the proper documentation. Elizabeth formally declared her rejection of his suit on the 8th of December, 1560. Henry Fitzalan was born around 1512 in London. He was a prominent lord during the reign of Henry VIII, Edward VI, Mary I, and Elizabeth I. It was during Elizabeth's reign that he was the premier earl of the realm. In January 1559, Arundel was elected Chancellor of the University of Oxford. After only four months as Chancellor, he resigned the office, most likely due to religious motives. Elizabeth visited him at Nunsuch Palace in August of 1559. For five days, she was entertained with banquets, masks, and music. She visited Nunsuch and Arundel many times after. Was Elizabeth deciding if a marriage with Arundel was suitable? As a widower, Arundel was named as a suitor who might aspire to the Queen's hand. Apparently, in 1561, this news led to a fight between himself and Robert Dudley. At the time, Dudley's wife had died a year earlier and Dudley was free to marry again. So was he jealous? Sir William Pickering was born in 1516 and was an English courtier and diplomat. Bishop John Jewell corresponded with the leader of the Protestant churches in Zurich and said, quote, nothing as yet about the queen's marriage. The son of John Frederick and the younger brother of Maximilian are suitors. The common impression is in favor of an Englishman named Pickering, a prudent and good man and of royal countenance. May God bless the match, whoever it is. The Earl of Arundel was none too happy that the queen would even consider Pickering. Quote, Being a brave, wise, comely English gentleman was seriously thought of as a suitor for Elizabeth's hand. In 1559, the Earl of Arundel was said to have sold his lands and was ready to flee out of the realm with the money because he could not abide in England if the Queen should marry Mr. Pickering, for they were enemies. At one point, it was reported that William had secret visits with the Queen and he had taken up residence at court. He was known to entertain lavishly and showed great tastes. The Earl of Arundel was said to be jealous of William as his rival suitor and challenged the second Earl of Bedford to a duel for having spoken ill of him. The truth is probably that Pickering never considered himself a suitor. He was recorded by telling ambassadors that the Queen, Elizabeth, would quote, laugh at him and at all the rest of them as he knew she meant to die a maid, end quote. Then there was Eric of Sweden, born to Gustav I of Sweden and his wife, Catherine, on the 13th of December, 1533, in Stockholm, Sweden. Eric ruled as king of Sweden from 1516 until he was deposed in 1568. He had sought to improve his reputation by securing a marriage with Queen Elizabeth. Eric courted Elizabeth for years. He even sent her love letters written in Latin. He also went so far as to send his brother to the English court, where he, quote, scattered silver like a shower of falling stars in the London streets and told the crowds that whereas he scattered silver, his brother would scatter gold, end quote. Eric also sent Elizabeth a portrait of himself, making his interest for her hand in marriage known. But when Eric expressed an intention to visit her, Elizabeth fired off this letter, which was filled with apparent regret that she could not share his feelings, but made it clear that he should not set foot in England. So here's part of the letter that Queen Elizabeth wrote to King Eric in February 1560. It was translated from Latin. Most serene prince, our very dear cousin, a letter truly yours, both in writing and sentiment, was given us on the 30th of December by your very dear brother, the Duke of Finland. And while we perceive therefrom that the zeal and love of your mind towards us is not diminished, yet in part we are grieved that we cannot gratify your serene highness with the same kind of affection, and that indeed does not happen because we doubt in any way of your love and honor, But as often as we testified both in words and in writing that we have never yet conceived a feeling of that kind of affection toward anyone. 
We therefore beg your serene highness again and again that you be pleased to set a limit to your love, that it advance not beyond the laws of friendship for the present nor disregard them in the future. I have always given both to your brother, who is certainly a most excellent prince and deservedly very dear to us, and also to your ambassador likewise. The same answer with scarcely any variation of the words, that we do not conceive in our heart to take a husband, but highly commend the single life and hope that your serene highness will no longer spend time in waiting for us. Signed, Elizabeth. Elizabeth seems to have slowed her courtship with Eric intentionally, but King Eric was never deterred. He was determined to wed Elizabeth. It wasn't until the rumors of Elizabeth and Robert Dudley that the king started to become upset and even challenged Dudley to a duel. There was a lot of duels going on. (laughs) The duel never happened as King Eric was, quote, talked off the ledge by his envoy. Then we have Adolphus of Gottorp, Duke of Holstein. Adolphus was born the third son of King Frederick I of Denmark and his second wife, Sophie of Pomerania, in 1526. Adolphus was thought of highly enough in England to be made a Knight of the Garter in 1560 to fill the vacancy that had been left by Francis Talbot, 5th Earl of Shrewsbury, after his death. On the 21st of August, 1560, Elizabeth received a letter from Adolphus that thanked her for the Order of St. George of the Garter, which was communicated to him by the letter of Henry Carey. This is reiterated a bit in Angus Strickland's, Agnes Strickland's book, The Life of Elizabeth. Here's a quote. While Elizabeth was yet amusing herself with the addresses of the royal Swedes, for there can be little doubt that Eric's jealousy of the brother, who finally deprived him of his crown, was well-founded, with regard to his attempts to supplant him in the good graces of the English queen. The king of Denmark sent his nephew, Adolphus, to try his fortune with the illustrious spinster. He was young, handsome, valiant, and accomplished, and in love with the queen. But though one of the busybodies of the court wrote to her ambassador in Paris that, quote, that it was whispered her majesty was very fond of him, end quote. He was rejected like the rest of her princely wooers. She, however, treated him with great distinction, made him a knight of garter, and pensioned him for life. Four years later, the duke married Christine of Hesse, and they had roughly ten children together. Henry... Duke of Anjou was the son of King Henry II of France and Catherine de' Medici. He was born in 1551. There was a point when Charles IX of France was suggested for Elizabeth's hand before it was realized that neither monarch was willing to leave their country. That is, when the younger brother, Henry, the Duke of Anjou, was suggested. In 1570, Catherine de' Medici wanted her son to marry the Queen of England. However, Henry would hear nothing of it. He insisted that Elizabeth was too old for him, plus she was the daughter of a Protestant, not to mention the fact that he considered her illegitimate. In addition to these objections, he also wanted to steer clear of the drama regarding Elizabeth and Robert Dudley's, quote, affair. Another quote of Strickland's in the life of Elizabeth regarding the Duke of Anjou. I find myself... On the one hand, much honored by the proposal of the French king. On the other, I am older than he and would rather die than see myself despised and neglected. My subjects, I am assured, would oppose no obstacle, if it were my wish, for they have more than once prayed for me to marry after my own inclination. It is true they have said that it would pleasure them if my choice should fall on an Englishman. In England, however, there is no one disposable in marriage but the Earl of Arundel, and he is further removed from the match than the East from the West. And as to the Earl of Leicester, I have always loved his virtues. But the aspirations toward honor and greatness which are in me cannot suffer him as a companion and husband. Then we move to the Archduke Charles of Austria. In 1559 and again from 1564 to 68, there were negotiations for a marriage between Charles and Queen Elizabeth. His father, the Emperor Ferdinand I, expected Elizabeth to be okay with Charles of Austria to rule England if she died childless. As with all of her other suitors, Elizabeth dragged out the negotiations, most likely knowing all along that she would not agree to marry. As with many of her suitors, religious beliefs were an issue with the Catholic Archduke. Negotiations lasted many years as Elizabeth played suitors off against each other and tried to keep everyone happy. 
Alison Ware and Elizabeth the Queen said, quote, She, Elizabeth, had acknowledged that the Archduke was the best foreign match for her, but she waxed alternatively hot and cold over the matter, end quote. The Queen's answer to the Emperor on the 30th of June, 1559, said, quote, Thanks for his goodwill and the offer of his son in marriage. Can only speak with her mouth as she finds in her heart which is truly no certain inclination or disposition to marriage, but rather a contention to enjoy and continue in this unmarried life. Yet, as the nobles and other states of the realm are therein somewhat importune, she will not therefore make any precise determination or vow to the contrary. Should she hereafter like a marriage and alter her mind, she trusts by God's favor to make no choice but of such one as shall be both very honorable and not unlike to her own estate, nor unmeet for these her kingdoms, is not better affected to any house or family in Christendom than to the house of Austria. Then there was a report that the Archduke was in a treaty for the hand of Mary, Queen of Scots. This filled Elizabeth with such jealousy that, quote, for all of the princes of Europe, he was esteemed the most honorable and chivalric, and Elizabeth's rejection of his suit appears to have been only for the purpose of obtaining concessions on the subject of his religion, more consistent with her own profession, end quote. Then we move on to Francis, Duke of Anjou. Francis was the son of King Henry II of France and Catherine de Medici. He was born in 1555. No, not the Francis that was Mary Stuart's first husband. His younger brother, who was born Hercule, Francois. His name was changed in honor of his late brother when he was confirmed. In 1579, Jean, I'm going to slaughter this French name. In 1579, Jean de Samir arrived in England on the 6th of January to negotiate a marriage between Queen Elizabeth and the Duke of Anjou. Council members took in all factors as to whether or not the marriage would be beneficial to England. They were divided. The Duke of Anjou had courted Elizabeth from 1578 to 1581 without success. Elizabeth seemed very interested in Francis and even called him her little frog. Even though they were separated in age by two decades, he was only 24, the two became very close. Unfortunately, the opposition of some of her counselors and concerns from her subjects over the French takeover led her to end the courtship. She would have no more suitors. On the departure of Francis, the Duke of Anjou, Elizabeth penned a poem. I grieve and dare not show my discontent. I love and yet am forced to seem to hate. I do, yet dare not say I ever meant. I seem stark mute, but inwardly do prate. I am and not. I freeze and yet am burned. Since myself another self I turned. My care is like my shadow in the sun, follows me flying, flies when I pursue it. Stands and lies by me, doth what I have done. His too familiar care doth make me rue it. No means I find to rid him from my breast, till by the end of things it be suppressed. Some gentler passion slide into my mind, for I am soft and made of melting snow. Or be more cruel, love, and so be kind. Let me, or float, or sink, be high or low, or let me live with some more sweet content, or die and forget what love er meant. So there it was, my first fun supplemental episode. Next time, I'll wrap up the Life of Tudor England series with my final parts. Thank you so much again for joining me this week. Until next time.